last week we began the year 2021, even though it was the second week of January, but we began the year of 2021 uh, with a new series, a new sermon series. And it's a brand new sermon series through the second letter to the Thessalonians from the Apostle Paul and his co-laborers, Silas and Timothy. And uh, we named this series Flourishing in Suffering. And the reason why we named it Flourishing in Suffering is because we have witnessed from this first century church in the city of Thessalonica that, that they are experiencing vast suffering. They are experiencing vast suffering in the form of religious persecution. So not only are they dealing with being a Roman colony, they've been colonized, it's a Roman colony, right? Not only are they dealing with uh, uh, being under the oppression of the Roman rule, not only are they dealing with all the trials that come from being a conquered people, not only are they suffering the realities of fallen humanity, right? The, the, the existence of sickness and health issues, turmoil, uh, brokenness, broken relationships, racism, oppression, uh, hatred, all these sorts of things are things that they are experiencing, but be, beyond that, they're also experiencing persecution, religious persecution. They are being mistreated. Uh, they, are, they, they, they have uh, uh, the, the culture and the community around them continually be antagonistic against them. Why? Because of their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. So this church is suffering, yet what we have learned throughout both letters uh, is that Paul writes to them, and he writes to them in the midst of this suffering, and what we hear from Paul is he's, he's boasting about the reality that this church, instead of dying, instead of hurting, this church is actually flourishing. They're growing in their faith. Now your pastors, beloved, strongly believe that these letters to the Thessalonians are extremely relevant to believers today because we find ourselves in times where our faith is beginning to be viewed with great antagonism in, co in our cultural circles. And the time is here and the time is near and the time is coming where on top of all the other suffering that we uh, experience in a fallen world, we will also see the persecution of the church. I believe that. I believe that each and every one of us will see the persecution of the church here in America. And Paul and his companions write this second letter to the Thessalonians to encourage them, to enlighten them, and to exhort them regarding their hope in the midst of persecution. Now, as we began last week, we began the portion of encouragement in this letter. That's where we're at in the first chapter. The, the, the portion of encouragement in this letter. And we ended with verse 5, where Paul, in an encouraging manner, reminds them that the persecution and the afflictions that they are enduring are but the evidence of the righteous judgment of God. The afflictions they're going through, you can open up your Bibles, okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and in verse 5, Paul encourages them by reminding them that the persecution and the afflictions that they're enduring are but the evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Now we saw that, that that doesn't mean that God is judging them through those afflictions. But what that does mean is that through those afflictions... God was doing two things, two things. Number one, God is making them worthy of his kingdom. He's making them worthy of his kingdom. Now, when I say worthy of his kingdom, it doesn't mean he's making them deserving of his kingdom. When we hear the Bible say worthy of the calling, it doesn't mean that God wants you to deserve the calling. Okay, he's not talking about deserving. Paul is not saying that we have to suffer in order to deserve God's kingdom. But what he's saying is that as we suffer, God is using the suffering 
to conform our hearts into his kingdom. Beloved, God uses our suffering for our good. Now, I know that we hate to hear that. I know that we hate to hear that. But that which the evil one means for evil, what Jonathan uh, read today, God will use it for greater good. For us to be conformed into the image of God. Now, the second thing that God is doing through our afflictions is he is collecting evidence. You see that there, right, in, in verse 5? He, he, he is collecting evidence. Uh, you see, in, in verse 5, he says, oh, you know, pretty much what he's saying is, uh, you, you know, uh, beloved, not, not any act of affliction against you will go unpunished. We will, he will not miss any evidence against those who afflict us. So Paul is encouraging the believers in Thessalonica, and I hope he's us, encouraging us here tonight, reminding us that in spite of all the afflictions in the life of the believer, God's justice will prevail. And we can live with great hope. So let me ask you a question. Are you ready to see the hope that we have in the midst of an unjust world? And that's what we're going to see in verses 6 through 12. So let's read it together. Verses 6 through 12. This is God's word to us tonight. It says this. Since it is just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us. This will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels. When he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. On that day when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at by all those who have believed... Because our testimony among you was believed. In view of this, we always pray for you that our God will make you worthy of his calling. And by his power, fulfill your every desire to do good and your work produced by faith. So that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified by you and you by him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Well, Father, we just uh, thank you. For your word. We thank you for the scriptures that we read. And we pray Lord that you would use it. To encourage us. Just as you meant to encourage the Thessalonians. Lord that we would know. That you are our just judge. And that you will render judgment. In your timing. And that you have called us to a journey. A journey. Where we will experience your glory. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would help us see these things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, there are many stories in the Bible, many amazing stories in the Bible, where we are able to witness the greatness of the evil in the heart of men, right? I mean, I think the whole Bible speaks of this. The whole Bible over and over shows us the greatness of the wickedness in the heart of men. Uh, my wife and I, my wife Christine, uh, we just finished uh, this Netflix series documentary on a serial killer in Southern California that was nicknamed the Night Stalker back in 1985. Now, I don't want to spoil this series for you, um, but this man was so evil, so evil, the things that he did. And when he is finally caught and you hear him, because, you know, they interview him and, and they have sections of interviews, things that he says to the cameras. And when you hear him and when you see his face, he literally sounds and looks like a demon in the flesh. That's how evil he is. And Christine and I were so overwhelmed by the evil in this man and this got to me, you know, it got to me, it got me thinking that so often we don't realize how wicked humankind is. 
One Old Testament story that really speaks of the wickedness of the human heart is the story of Abraham and his nephew Lot. Now, if you have never read that story, I invite you to read it at home. Perhaps maybe, you know, in the dinner table, grab your family, grab your kids, sit them down and read Genesis 13 through 19. And you'll read the story. Now, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but here, here's pretty much what happens. Lot separates himself from Abraham. Uh, you know, they get into a little scuffle, separates from Abraham, and, uh, and uh, he eventually ends up in Sodom and Gomorrah and with his, with his family and among the darkness in, in, in there and with the people there, right? And you can read all of that evil that went on there, and eventually God decides that he has, he has had enough. He has had enough with the evil in Sodom and Gomorrah. And on his way to destroy the city, he has a conversation with Abraham. And he has a conversation with Abraham knowing that his nephew Lot is there. And, and he wants to reveal to Abraham what he's going to do. Right? And so when God reveals to Abraham what he's going to do, Abraham uh, begins to intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah. And listen to his intercession. Listen to his intercession in Genesis 18, verse 23. This is what Abraham says to God. Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? In other words, Abraham is questioning God's justice. He is questioning God's justice. He he is asking God, with with all your respect, Lord, uh, is it just that you would pour down fire from the sky on both the wicked and the righteous? Now, what is Abraham assuming here? He is assuming that there are righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, beloved, this is the problem with so many of us. We often make this assumption that God's standard of justice is like ours. And we assume that some of us are surely righteous in comparison with the rest of society. And therefore, we don't deserve God's judgment like others do. Right? When I, when I look at the Night Stalker in 1985... I think, man, that guy is evil. And me and my wife sit on the couch and, you know, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not like him. But the reality is that we are not much different than the night stalker. Listen to the way God answers Abraham. In verse 26, the Lord says, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. So God is saying to Abraham, if I find 50 righteous people in all of Miami, I will spare my judgments. I mean, come on, surely God can find 50 people. There's more than 50 people here. At least 50 of us are righteous, right? So Abraham gets a little smart aleck. And he says, well, what if instead of 50, you only find 45? And once again, God says, if I find 45, I will spare the city. So Abraham continues and the count continues to come down all the way to 10. And God says, if I find 10 righteous people... I will spare it. Now, we all know what happened in the story. God destroys the city. Why? Because God is just. And in his justice, he must pour out his wrath on the wicked. And my brothers and sisters, we are all wicked. God could not find one person that was righteous in the city of Sodom. 
And my brothers and sisters, if God looked at Miami, he would not find one righteous person either. This is what the outcry for justice by men in our culture always forgets concerning true justice. We forget that we are unjust. So let's look really quickly at the injustice of man. Really quickly, I'm going to walk you through some scriptures really quickly. First of all, we see in Genesis 6, verse 3, the Lord is looking at all the earth. And look at what the Lord says in verse 3. He says, my spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they are corrupt. That's how God sees us. Verse 5, he says, when the Lord saw that, that human wickedness what was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil. You get that? That that is who we are in front of God. It's not that, you know, we have some good and we have some bad. No, 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 listen. Every inclination is evil. Romans 1 says this, verse 29 through 31. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanders. God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, in inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. I mean, I read this and I, I, can, I can raise my hand on every single one of them. And verse 23 of Romans 3, 23 finally tells us this. For all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. Listen, there is not one of us that is just. Not one. So here's our driving question today. In light of the injustice of man, what hope does the Christian enjoy? In light of the injustice of man, what hope does the Christian enjoy? Three things. Number one, we enjoy a just judge. We enjoy a just judge. Look at verse 6. It says, since it is just for God to repay with afflictions those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us. Now, I want us to notice that Paul's words of encouragement for the believers in Thessalonica are not meant to drive them to some sort of social activism. Right? Nowhere in this letter uh, will he encourage them to fight against their oppressors. Uh, nowhere in this letter is he going to encourage them to fight against uh, their persecutors. He's not going to encourage them to become advocates for political policies that will protect them. He's not going to do that. In fact, his words of encouragement don't even instruct them concerning the here and the now of their everyday struggles. But what Paul does do is he lifts their gaze to the heavens where their Savior will one day in all his glory appear to institute the justice of God. That's what he does. Beloved, listen to me. Our hope is not in this fallen world. Our hope, you know, is not that somehow there are going to be policies and there's going to be rules and, and laws and, and, and all kinds of things that are going to somehow institute the justice of God. That's not our hope. Our hope is not that the government will bring us relief. Our, our, our hope is not that institutions will bring us relief. But our hope is in the hands of a just judge. 
our judge. Beloved, there is only one judge, only one just judge, and it is not the state. It is not BLM. It is not social activism. In fact, it's not even the church. I grieve at the amount of judgment there is in our world today, and especially in the church. I feel like in the church, we all want to put our judge's robe on, and we all want to walk around with our gavel making judgments of others. And we do so with such ease, with a spirit of self-righteousness that, let me tell you something, it is devilish. I mean, I see in social media, men and women supposedly in Christ throwing judgments upon their brothers and sisters that don't share the same social political views. I see brothers and sisters becoming the mouthpieces of the state's agenda and and judging others on the basis of their socioeconomic status or on the basis of the color of their skin or on the basis of their political affiliations. Everywhere you look, there is judgment. And here is the problem with that. We have forgotten that there is only one just judge and his name is not Jose Prado. His name is Jesus. In fact, that judge tells me to be very careful with my judgments because my heart is wicked above all. And before I judge anything, I need to take the log out of my eye. So Paul doesn't tell them to take actions against their oppressors, against their persecutors, but he encourages them to look up to the coming just judge. Now what will that judge accomplish for us? What will that judge accomplish for us? Here are two things quickly. He's going to accomplish rescue from our enemies. Now look at verse 6. It says, since it is just for God. And look at what he's going to do. He is the just judge. God is the, ju- the judge. Not, not anyone else. Right? What is he going to do? He's going to repay with afflictions those who afflict you. And so he is going to rescue us from our enemies. The second thing that God is going to do is he's going to relieve us or give us relief from our sorrows. Look at verse 7. It says, and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us. And so you see, we, we have this hope. Uh, and Paul wants us to be encouraged uh, in the midst of our, our afflictions, in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of all the injustice that we see around us and all the injustice that we see in us, he wants to encourage us that there is a just judge and that just judge is the one who will accomplish rescue from our enemies and relief from our sorrows. That's what he's going to do. In fact, my brothers and sisters, Revelation 21 gives us a beautiful picture of this. When, when, when John writes uh, of his vision and he says, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. The judge has come and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the the previous things have passed away. That is our hope. We have a just judge who will accomplish what we need. Well, The second thing that he encourages them with is that we have a just judgment coming. Look at verse 7, it says this, this will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels. Now this is amazing for me 
Uh, because Paul is giving them, you know, the, the, these people are suffering. They're being persecuted. They're being put in jail. They're being, you know, uh, threatened to death. That's why Paul had to flee the city. And that's why Paul couldn't come to them. He had to write to them and send messengers to them, right? And so they, they, they have this persecution upon them. And, and, and Paul, instead of instructing them on, on the way they have to fight and the way they have to stand up for themselves and the way they have to defend themselves, instead of that, he tells them that they have a hope that's much greater, this judge judge who will come and accomplish what they can accomplish and this judge judge that will come and exercise his just justice, his judgment. But here's what we learn about what we can expect about this judgment. What can we expect? Well, number one, we can expect the season of the judgment. What season is it? Well, look at verse 7 again. It says, this will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus. Oh, my brothers and sisters. Did you hear that? Brothers and sisters, true justice will be rendered at the coming of Christ. Not now. Do you hear that? Oh, so much outcry for justice. Oh, we need justice. We need this. We need, you know, economic equality. And we need, you know, to fight for this. And we need to fight for that. When does God say justice will come? At the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word justice is pretty, it's pretty popular in our culture. Everyone wants justice. And let me tell you something. There is this humanistic aspect of justice that is so focused on particular ailments of society and yet ignores others. And ultimately ignores the true justice that God requires and that God will render. This is very important for us to know. That our judge is Christ. And his judgment will be rendered upon his coming. The elements of society will not cease to exist prior to his coming. Post-millennials. That doesn't mean we don't care about them. As we will see in our last point tonight. There is a life. There is a journey that we embark as believers that is just in the eyes of God. But we cannot join the outcry of our cultural narratives that seek some sort of humanistic utopia without the judge being present. Beloved, we will, we will be teaching from the book of Revelations at the end of the year, towards the end of the year. And in it, we will see that the dragon, the great serpent of old, the dragon has two mouthpieces. We see that in Revelations 13. There's two beasts. One that comes out of the ocean, one that comes out of the land. Two mouthpieces. One is political in nature, the other one is religious in nature. And the religious mouthpiece will regurgitate the agenda of the political mouthpiece. And my brothers and sisters, that is exactly what we're seeing today in our culture. On both sides of the political aisle. The church of Jesus Christ is not the mouthpiece of the state, but the mouthpiece of God. And the message of the dragon and the message of God are very different messages. Very different messages. The message of God is, you're lost. I sent my son, the Savior. Follow him and be saved from the coming judgment. The message of the dragon is a message of progressive humanistic evolution. 
where in our power we make this world a better place for all humanity. It is actually when they think that they have achieved this that Christ will come. It is actually when they think they have achieved this. It's, it's, the word tells, tells us that when they say peace, peace, destruction will come. Beloved, our judge is coming and it is at his coming that we will see true, genuine justice. We're not going to see it before that. We're not. The serpent wants to lie and deceive and tell humanity that they can better themselves. What? God said marriage was between a man and a woman? What? Come on, man. We got to evolve from that. We got to progress. It's not just a man and a woman. A man and a man can love each other the same. A woman and a woman can love each other the same. What? God said there was two genders? No. Come on, man. There's thousands of genders. We know better. See, the message of the dragon... It's always going to be a message of love and love and peace. And man, a, a, a beautiful society where everybody loves each other. Everybody accepts each other. Every, everybody is so friendly. That's the message of the dragon. Because it seeks to accomplish that without the judge and without his justice. It also forgets the, the third thing. It forgets the standard of God. Look at verse 8. It says, when he takes vengeance with flaming fire, on who? On racist people? On who? On Trumpers? On who? On bad people? Evil people? People that I don't love? Who? On those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul not only reveals to us the season of God's judgment, but also he reveals to us the standard of God's judgment. The reason why we often walk around with swag in our step as opposed to walking with a limp when it comes to righteousness is because we have changed God's standards of righteousness. I was watching a video the other day of, of, uh, of a friend of mine. Uh, he's not a close friend, but I've, you know, I've, I've uh, had lunch with him a few times and stuff. And this friend of mine does uh, street preaching. Now, I'm not a great fan of how he does street preaching, okay? But I respect the heck out of him. Because he's out in the streets of Miami, open air preaching the coming judgment of God and the coming Savior. So I respect him. So in one of his videos, he's speaking to a young couple coming out of this like nightclub or something at the beach. And they begin to mock him. This couple begins to mock him and they tell him how unloving he is. And for some reason, they get into an argument about the LGBT community and, and, and stuff. And, and they begin to tell him, you're hateful. Your preaching is hateful. And they tell him, you know what? They, they literally say to him, uh, the, the young man that's mocking him says, I know gay people that are much more loving than you are. Now, mind you, my friend is a rough looking dude, okay? He grew up in the streets of Miami. He was a gang leader in Miami. He, he is all thugged out, okay? <laughs> if you know what I mean. But here's the reason why I share this. The mocker is probably right. I don't doubt that he knows unbelievers that are much more loving than believers. That's true. But the problem 
with that is that God's standard is not our standard. When you face your creator on judgment day, he will not bring out the love meter to see if you're good or if you're not. God is not going to judge me according to how patriotic I was or how woke I was or how racist I was or how unloving I was. God is going to judge me according to another standard. And that standard is this. Do you know me? And do you know my gospel? That's the standard. Do you know me? In other words, really, is do I know you? Do I know you? Are we united in Christ? My gospel, my son. That's the standard. Man, see, you're starting to see the problem with us viewing the ailments of society through other lenses that are not God's standard. Now here's the settlement. He gives us the settlement. Verse 9 says, so there's two settlements, one for sinners, one for saints, one for, for the ones that don't know him, And one for the ones that do know him. Verse 9, for the ones that don't know him, says, They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. Now, this is what my friend preaches on the street. But yes, this sounds hateful, doesn't it? It sounds bigoted. It sounds unloving. This is God's judgment. This is what God says will come to those who do not know him and his gospel. So what's going to happen to those who do know him? Verse 10. On that day, when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at by all those who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. My brothers and sisters, for those of us sinners, unworthy, unjust, wicked, but because of the goodness of God in Jesus Christ, who came and lived righteously in our place, and who came and died our death, because of faith, We will be glorified in him. And he will be glorified in us. And so when the just judge appears to render judgment upon this evil world, guess what? We will not receive that judgment. You know why? Because Jesus in his first coming already received that judgment in our place. God is just. He doesn't overlook any sin. But guess what happened? Every one of your sins has already rendered justice. The wrath of God was poured on Christ on your behalf. We will be glorified. I mean, this is amazing, guys. I want to point out something before we end. I want to point out this. That we have participation in this. And the participation that we have, we see it here in verse 10. It says, because our testimony among you was believed. Listen, we want justice. We want to see justice. You know how we're going to see justice? As we give our testimony of what Christ has done. 
as we preach the gospel to lost people and we give testimony, that is how we will see justice. Lastly, he shows us that we had hope in our just journey. We have a just journey. Look at verse 11. Here he changes, right, from revealing all these things to us about the judge and the judgment to then telling us how we ought to live in light of this. Verse 11 says, in view of this, in light of this, in light of the judge that's coming, in light of the judgment that he will bring, we always pray for you that our God will make you worthy of his calling and by his power fulfill your every desire to do good and your work produced by faith. My brothers and sisters, often when I talk about these things, I don't talk about it in social media anymore. I, I, I've, I've quit. But often when I talk about these things with people, people are like, well, but you know, the, like we should care about the poor, and, and we should care about the oppressed, and, and we should care about uh, those who are being afflicted. And I say, Amen. Yes. Yes. Our primary way that we love people is through our preaching of the gospel. Our primary way that we love people is through our testimony so that they will receive the just judge, and not receive his judgment on judgment day. But because we have enjoyed his, his, his union with us, because we have enjoyed this fellowship with Christ, because of that, now we can pray. And as we pray, we ask God you know, to, uh, to change us inside, to conform us. Remember what I said about being worthy of the calling? What does that mean? To conform us into his image. And that by his power to then bring about the desires of God in this world. To do good. To do good works. To love our neighbor. To love our neighbor. But that is produced by faith. It's not produced by our, you know, now we're going to become the good works church. Now we're going to become the social justice church. Now we're going to become the woke church. Or now we're going to become the patriotic church. No. No. No, we are the church of Jesus Christ. We have one message. Repent and believe the gospel of Jesus. Because the just judge is coming and he's rendering judgment. And the only way that you can survive is if you're united to Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to end with this. Church, listen. I don't want to minimize the hurt and the pain of the injustices that we experience in our lives. I know some of you came out of your countries, you know, because of whatever, communism or whatever, and man, you lost a lot, and it hurts. Listen to me. I left my country at the age of 10. I still remember going to bed at night and crying myself to sleep. We have some kids here that are around that age. And I remember crying myself to sleep because I miss my mom. I miss my sister. I miss my home. I miss my dogs. I live with an aunt that abused me. And would beat me almost every day.
Then she put me on an airplane, and I came to live in Miami with an uncle who emotionally abused me. And eventually called my mom and said, I can't handle him. I can't be with, I can't take care of him. Listen, I, I know what it is to feel pain. To have injustices done against you. But I remember that day when I walked in that church and I sat in the front. I was an angry young 23 year old. You know, I had anger against my mom, I had anger against my dad, you know, I had anger against the world. I was going to, man, I was gonna be the just one, right? I was going to be the one who made something of myself, chip huge rock on my shoulder, right? A lot, lot of pride and anger. You know why? Because I saw myself as the victim of injustice. And I, I was. But that became my identity. It became my identity. It became, I'm a victim. But when I walked into that church and I heard the gospel, that gospel revealed to me that the only victim in this world was Jesus. And he became a victim in my place. So that I no longer had to, you know, first of all, be judged by God for what I deserved. Because I deserved worse than what I got. And second of all, so that I no longer had to carry those injustices that were committed against me. It freed me. Jesus freed me. It freed me to love my mom. It freed me to love my dad. It's freeing me to love people that I would normally not love. That's why here Paul says that it is by faith that God works desires in our hearts to do good and works of righteousness. My brothers and sisters, only the gospel can free us from our brokenness to live just lives. Only the gospel. Let's stand up. I'm going to pray for us. And after I pray, um, we're going to do a, a, a row here on this, on my right hand, on my left Right, right hand, your left. And then we're going to do another row on this side. Uh, and we're going to come to this table where once again we're reminded, right, here, here was God's judgment rendered for us. Right here. His body was broken. His blood was shed for us. For us. Let me pray. Father. Lord, I just, uh, I just thank you for Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that in the midst of an unjust world, in the midst of injustices all around us, and even injustice in our own hearts, Lord, because I, Lord, there are still so many areas of my heart where anger and, and hatred and strife and, you know, just, just things just pop up, Lord, all the time. And... I know that's not my identity anymore. I know that my identity is in you. I'm your son. But Lord, uh, I just thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of all this, Lord, we can look up. We can look up. And we can be reminded that we have a just judge. One who, who is coming. One who 
at his appearance will bring about and render all justice. One who will usher us into the kingdom of God. The one who died for us. The one who shed his blood. The one whose body was broken for us. The one who took our judgment so that we would receive God's grace. So Lord, I pray, Lord, that this message would really impact our hearts to live lives in a journey, a journey, a just journey. We're led by the faith that we have believed we do good for our brothers and sisters. We love our neighbor out of faith. Lord, I pray, would you help us? In Jesus' name, amen, amen.